So my name's Peter Davis, uh, and I'm going to moderate this panel. Uh, you can probably tell I'm an Aussie. Okay, I'm going to attempt to do this in English, so just bear with me. Okay? <laughs> so um, first thing I'd like to do, uh, I'll start off. I'm, uh, I, I run a company called Sport Performance Management, and I consult with organizations on a number of different things, either high performance or athlete development, coach development. And so I've been involved with Project Play for a couple of years, since the beginning, I guess. Um, or since it got started as a project play, and, uh, and uh, working through this concept of developing more effective youth sport programs and a youth sport system in the US. I live in Colorado, so I'm one of the lucky ones who get to live in Colorado. And we, I've heard a couple of times this morning how great it is to live there because everybody's fit, but I think we're not the only place. But anyway, so I'd like to introduce the rest of the panel, and I'm going to have to read from my notes here. First, to my left, is Steve Boyle. And each one of the panelists will explain a little bit more, more about their organization in a few minutes. But just to quickly run through, uh, Steve co-founded an organization called 241 Sports okay, with his wife, Kerry. Okay, and 241 Sports was voted the best summer camp right, by the Hartford Magazine, best summer camp in Maine. Connecticut. In Connecticut by the new Hartford Magazine. And uh, St um, Steve's daughter is a lacrosse player. She's a two-time All-American high school lacrosse player, which will come into play uh, a little later when Steve talks. To the, to next to the left is David Esquith. David is the director of the Office of Safe and Healthy Students at the US Department of Education. And he'll explain a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, he's also a former, former special education teacher and as a, a volunteer for the Peace Corps. Is that right? Yes. OK. And then we have Tim Morehouse. Tim is a founder of fencing in schools and is a fencer himself, and in fact is a silver medalist from the Olympics for the US. Okay. And then on the far left is Mary Wittenberg, who's the CEO of the New York Roadrunners and uh, is a, ran the marathon, the Olympic trials marathon in 1988. Correct? I was the first dropout. Did they put that in there? <laughs> <laughs> they, the, I, I didn't two. put that down. <laughs> And, uh, and you know, one of the things you'll talk about is the multi-sport athletes and, and, and sports sampling. So I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page here with sports sampling. Okay? It's um, the, the developing a, an effective youth sports system. And I heard someone say it this morning, this is a movement and this is a, uh, a concept that's, that's pretty strong in quite a few other countries. And we're not quite as strong in the US as some of the other countries. And it's based on a lot of different principles, like physical literacy, like sports sampling. Um, uh, like equity and, and inclusion and so forth. And one of the issues that has come up from time to time that we were looking at and to want to talk about today is this idea of playing multiple sports. And there's a lot of different reasons why that's important, and we'll, we'll hear about those. But we don't want to really debate sport sampling as to what, you know, what the literature says about why it's effective and why, you know, why it's a good idea. I think we're going to take it for a fact right now that it's a good idea. Okay? We're not going to debate that. What we want to talk about today are ways that we can build that ways that we can build that into the sports system, ways that we can enhance it, ways communities can get involved. And if you've read the Project Play book, which most of you, you should all have, if you haven't read it before, and you will see that there's, uh, there's, there are different there's suggestions for different organisations, whether you're a parent or a community sport leader or a coach or a phys ed teacher. I want to get a quick idea as to who we're talking to here. Who, who are coaches? A couple of coaches. I mean, you can be more than, more than one thing, by the way. You can be a coach, coaching kids, um, sport leaders, community sport leaders like Sport and Rec, YMCA's, sport departments. One person sort of put their hand up. Um, here is a parent. You can be a parent and a coach. Um, phys ed teachers, high school, college, university, physical education, sport management programs, things like that. Who have I missed? Coaches? We talked about coaches, didn't we? I always come back to coaches. Who else have I missed? Physicians. Physicians? <coughs> Very good. Yeah. Physicians? Health professionals. Sorry. Health professionals. <coughs> health professionals. So we've got a pretty good mix of uh, who's involved with uh, an NGV, a national governing body. I, know, I see a few. OK. Um, so we've got a good mix of people who are involved as sport leaders at different levels of the, of the sports system. So that's good. So hopefully we'll get some, some good ideas that will come out of this. Um, the, uh, so what we want to do is I'm going to go through, I'm going to ask the panelists two questions <coughs> in terms of why this is important, what their organisation does, why it's important for the organisation, <coughs> and then start to talk about how we can enhance that and start to build that into the system. We have this spiralling epidemic that I call 
um, that I, and I, I'm just not the only one who sees this, uh, of kids specialising in sports nearly immediately. And there's this push from sports to be on the, on the travel team or this push from sports to, um, to specialise immediately. We get this message that, well, you can't be good in tennis or rugby or volleyball or anything unless you, that's all you do. And so it used to be that kids played multiple sports, different seasons. I heard the question, the very last question in the last session was, what happened to the seasons? What happened to the, to the basketball season and, the, and the, the baseball season? Now it's 24-7. Okay, and so these kids are getting pushed into this idea of just specialising in one sport, okay? which, which I think is a mistake. Maybe we'll hear from others. Maybe some people think it's not a mistake. And so we, we're trying to get back to the idea of saying kids need to sample different sports. They need to be exposed to different sports for a number of reasons, medical reasons, you know, health reasons with injuries, mental burnout, uh, to learn different <laughs> skills. We talked about physical literacy this morning. So where are they learning all, this, all the skills of multiple sports? if they only play one sport, if they just continue to do, use one sport system, one energy system, one set of muscles and so forth. And the chances if that, of those kids continuing in that sport may be good or may not be good, but if they then drop out and try to go to another sport, where, the, where are those skills going to come from? And so we want to talk about where sport sampling fits into this group. So I'm going to start with Steve. So Steve, tell us about 241 and why is sport sampling important and, and how does it, what, where is it essential for you? I think there's nothing worse than being on a panel where you have to follow the guy with the cool Australian accent. So I'm going to do my best. Um, so the, the quick uh, story, I, I, I sat down next to this guy in the bus today, and, um, and I'm chatting with him. And I, and I finally introduced myself. And I said, what, what's your name? He goes, uh, Gary Hall. Some people know. And I said, oh, my God, I'm such the little guy at this table. But I think it's important because Gary said to me, you know, he, go, he said it's the little guys that really are going to make the difference in this particular initiative. So yesterday I was doing my job as a middle school guidance counselor, and then I got on a plane. I feel really cool. I'm in D.C., get to talk about 241 sports. And um, so back in 2008, my then 9-year-old daughter uh, had tried out for a travel soccer team. And this guy says to me, he calls me up and says, your daughter's our number one prospect. And I, I said, my daughter is nine. She's, she's nobody's prospect. And uh, so for about, and this is, uh, you know, and she's our oldest of three. And he says, um, you know, he starts to tell us about his program and his system and how she's going to fit into it. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm really, you know, my ego is really stoked here. And then um, I said, well, look, my, my wife played um, uh, Division One lacrosse, and I played Division One basketball, and we, you know, she she's interested in playing lacrosse, and he went radio silent on me, like something had just happened, and then he said, "Hold on a second, like he was going to the back room of the car dealership, and he came back and said, "We're no longer interested," and um, I can't use the words that I used with him. Um, <laughs> because it's being filmed. Um, and uh, so the next day I talked to my wife about it and we said, um, you know, we could stand on a soapbox and we could shout to the mountaintops or we could infiltrate. And we came up with this tagline called Life's Too Short for Just One Sport. And that summer, my wife's an athletic director at a private school. We used her school and we ran a camp. We called it uh, the Three Season Sports Academy, the idea to bring the three season athlete back. But it resonated so quickly that um, it grew in the Connecticut area to us needing larger facilities. Then it was just girls. And because it was, it was sort of like the emperor's new clothes. Like we got the local high school coaches. We got the best athletes at the schools to be the counselors. And all of a sudden, everyone started to say, wait a second, my kid doesn't have to only play one sport to be the best possible athlete. You know, so since then, you know, it's evolved in a way that has really has us doing a ton of things, trying to get into the schools, to have kids' first experience with sports be one from a base, basis of athleticism, helping them feel good about the, those early opportunities, but also to not just identify as, I'm a soccer player, I'm a lacrosse player, I'm a basketball player. They, that you want them to say, I'm an athlete so that that's transferable, that that can cross over to any part of their athletic life as they move forward. So that's what we're about. Yeah. David. Um, well, thank you, and good morning. Again, I'm Dave Esquith. I'm the director of the Office of Safe and Healthy Students at the U.S. Department of Education. I'm really uh, honored to be on this, on this panel. And the perspective that I want to bring to uh, kind of what the Department of Education is doing and what we see uh, going on in schools around the country um, and I'll give you some idea. 
of the portfolio of my office to tie this together. Um, we have a physical education program. It's called the Carroll E. White uh, PE program. We make grants to uh, school districts and community-based organizations around the country. The other parts of my office's portfolio include school shootings, um, bullying, homelessness, <coughs> neglected youth, um, human trafficking of young girls into prostitution, um, and a whole range of uh, a very kind of disruptive and, and, and upsetting behaviors that are going on in schools. Um, the, the, the basis of what we're doing, trying to tie all of these things together, is to improve school climate and um, sports sampling. Um, and this idea that you're giving kids opportunities to try different things, um, to um, experiment and to explore, uh, I think really feeds into and reinforces the idea of helping kids to become independent, to build empathy and respect and, and feel like they have some control over their lives. So that um, we're very excited to be on this panel and this initiative, um, the grants that we make for the PEP program, um, we are really kind of focusing them on how do, how do these grants improve school climate? Um, how do they uh, build trust between students uh, uh, and, and adults and respect between students and each other? So I think this whole idea of sports sampling um, is really a, uh, an innovation and a, and a great idea, something that um, we would hope to see in some of the, uh, uh, the grants that we would make in the future. Thanks. Uh, honored to be here with so many amazing folks. So sports sampling is really near and dear to my heart because I, I started fencing completely by accident. I saw a sign at my school that said, join the fencing team, get out of PE. Uh, without knowing what it even was, I went to get out of PE because you got a free period and I had this plan that I was going to cut whatever this fencing thing was um, and have like a lot of free time and then I saw that it was sword fighting um, and I was a 13 year old boy and I was hooked um, and it was really the sport that changed my life it gave me you know all the stories you hear about self-confidence all of that even making the Olympics was great but just finding fencing by accident was huge um, when I uh, graduate college, I began teaching seventh grade in Washington Heights through Teach for America, and I also noticed that my kids had like little exposure to other sports. They had very little equipment. It was like maybe basketball and baseball they knew about, but something like fencing was completely off their radar screen. Um, so as, as, as I was finishing up the London Olympics, I started to think about how do I expose more kids? How do I get them to at least try fencing? At least, at least know that it exists, right? We're not building, fencing is not building fences around ha homes. Um, so we, we, in fencing, we don't have a lot of coaches. So we had to really think like, how can we innovate and do this? So our model is to train PE teachers at the school. Uh, we had this goal last year during our first full year, we we're gonna try to get 10,000 kids fencing. I wasn't quite sure how we were gonna do it and if schools would embrace it, but in our, in our now in our second, uh, full year, we have over 50 schools, uh, close to 15,000 kids who are fencing as part of their everyday PE. And we are training, oh, we've trained over 100 PE teachers who have never taught fencing before, uh, know nothing about the sport, so we're really in the coaches training business. Most of the PE teachers we work with are rarely, if ever, getting professional development at their school. And they're actually shocked, they're like, we're getting professional development, and they're, they're hungry for new things. So for other sports, I mean, I, I can see a lot of our teachers <laughs> loving to teach a lot of the different sports that are out there. And you know, I think it's so important just to come back to my own experience. I, I never would have had the opportunity to even do the sport if my school didn't have it and it was sort of by accident. And I want to make sure that if there are kids out there that it could have this impact on that they get a chance to try it. Mary. Mary Hi, Whitney. it's great to be here. Many people know our organization best for the TCS New York City Marathon and our 50 events for adults all year round, but a huge, um, part of what we do every day and really core to our mission is trying to help and inspire kids through running. And the idea of sports sampling is um, critical to us and we have an opportunity because running is a part in a base of so many sports. But one of the things we're always trying to do through our youth programs for those 12 and under is set up the programs. We're now in about 795 schools nationwide. We have 600 schools in New York City. We try to, number one, ensure it's fun. We've talked a lot, you've heard a lot, you've seen in the plan the importance of fun. Um, two, we purposely don't make it about winning at this age because the, one of the real advantages of sports sampling for kids under 12 is they can 
appreciate the benefits of sport beyond winning. They get to 12, if they don't have any sense of the benefits beyond winning, it does get really hard because at 12, especially the boys, but the girls too, winning becomes important. Um, so all of our programs, uh, our core program is Mighty Milers in the schools. We purposely set up the program so it's based on the kids' personal goals. And we will make sure they can't even figure out the finish line relative to everybody as they have their own personal finish lines. So we have these, these tricks that we use to help make sure they develop a sense of the benefits of pursuing their personal goals, the satisfaction that comes from that. And then, of course, obviously, we want them to have a lot of fun, meet other kids, and in the end, have not only kid benefit, but the whole school culture benefit from their participation in a sport, but one that's not just focused on winning every day. Thanks. OK, so what we want to do is start to field some questions or comments or suggestions as to how we can how we can make this more of a, a systematic part of our sports system. At the moment, like I said, we're in this sort of cycle of, um, of early specialization and s single sport. And could you imagine, and just as, as Tim said, you know, half the kids in the, in the US probably don't even know that they can fence. They don't even know they could do canoe kayak. They don't know they can do badminton as a real sport, not in the, the backyard as a, 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 in the garage or something, or table tennis. So not that that's wrong. But um, they don't, they're not even aware of some of these sports. And, and it's like, could you imagine if you could only eat three foods? You know, if, if our diet was basketball, baseball, football, which are all great sports, I love them. But if that was the only thing the kids were ever exposed to, and they don't know that there are all these other foods out there, uh, you know, it's, it's sad that they don't get to do this. So what we want to do is, is hear from you, is how can we break that cycle? How can we start to introduce programs or initiatives to, to, to get kids to sample more sports, to get them exposed to more, more things? So let's start over here. We have a question at, over here. Hi, I'm uh, Kevin. Can you identify yourself? Yeah. I'm sorry. Pardon me? Yeah, <clears throat> identify yourself and okay. then hit us with your question. Kevin Martinez with ESPN. Um, I think what would be helpful um, in some of the conversations we've had with uh, nonprofits and organizations is to talk about what each sport, how each sport develops the human being. Um, I am not a runner. I was in track and field in, in high school and I ran high, uh, high hurdles and long jump. I did not start running long distance until like three years ago. And once I figured out what the psyche of a runner was and how that compartmentalizes your thinking and whatever. To me, I was like, wow, I wish I had known this earlier, right? That you can actually be with yourself for a long period of time as you hear yourself huffing and puffing and to get through and the, the, the longevity of it. I'm wondering if that as, as we go forward, if we look at the sports, whether it's you know a handball or basketball or volleyball, what are the specific development opportunities that allow for you to cross-functionally train. So one, you can get coaches involved. Two, you can help parents understand that a balance is very important in this and basketball works very good with volleyball. Those types of things, I think, will help uh, establish a precedent on how you can move from sport to sport um, and give it a little bit more value. I'll start, Mike, I was actually at the Bristol Boys and Girls Club the other day with uh, talking about just this, and I know ESPN has done a lot to support them uh, in Bristol, Connecticut. And um, we talk about it all the time. In fact, all, all of the folks that work in any of our programs need to be able to be versed in what we call the crossover effect. So I'll use fencing as an example, um, because, example. because I love it. <laughs> and so I, it, kids love it if you say, take out your sword. but. I, if I have to say foil, but then they laugh if I say take out your sword because they're boys. And um, so when, when, you, when you teach uh, defense and basketball, one of the best ways to teach it is uh, to tell them take out your sword. If you want to close out on a jump shooter, you're going to do this, right? And so the fencers do the same thing. But now we're just teaching a kid how to don't just run out like this because then they're going to go by you, right, when you do it. But if you attack it this way, put your weight here and come back the same way I'm sure a fencer would do it, then that's the crossover skill. But that happens all the time. So some of the warm-up exercises we'll do, take um, tennis serve, for example. You know, toss it up and serve it. Well, catch a baseball and throw it, just transfer. So those things we try to show the crossover effect in as many sports as we can. The other thing we try to make sure coaches do is that they never use running as a punishment. 
All right? I like to use the word as an opportunity. <laughs> Running is an opportunity. All right? And because it does have a connotation, but it seems crazy to me that coaches get on the line and run when we're trying to get them to understand that running should be part of the cool part of sports. And so I think that you're absolutely right. And if we could get more coaches thinking that way and making it more fun so that the kid who might have been uh, known as a soccer player could see the transferability of those soccer skills to lacrosse or to something else, then uh, we're going to be doing a pretty good job. Can I, can I add a, yes. a point? I, I'd like to add kind of <clears throat> another dimension to, to the answer to this question. Um, in my office, we talk about four R's, not, not just the three R's. And that fourth R is relationships um, in terms of what they can do to improve school climate and school safety and, and build empathy and respect. So one of the advantages of sports sampling is that you're going to have relationships with lots of different kids and lots of different adults. And the more exposure you can have to different kids um, will help you build those skills to build relationships because kids need um, skills to do that as well. So I think it's another advantage of sampling is that you're also sampling a wider uh, range of, uh, of friends and adults that you're dealing with. I can just Mary, add, Mary, and then we have a question. Sorry, over here. Yes. I'll just add here something everyone can think about in the different sports. Um, what we're trying, Kevin, is how we talk to both teachers and parents. And for teachers, it's when they realize that cross country, and again, at 12 and under, we're keeping it very light, but it, when they, they had a little bit older, cross country is such a great base for every sport, right? It's tough, it's, they, they learn endurance. But the teachers also see, everyone, a lot of people can be on the team, so they get the benefit of that. And, and the kids, there's a real focus that comes from a sport like cross country, where you're running a mile or so, a little bit longer, versus just the, the speed sports. And so sometimes teachers can see the benefits of that in their kids and parents in a day and age when everything's so immediate, there's a purity in cross country and a, 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 a period of time there where can only be but so distracted that can be really good for kids. But what we're doing with adults is we, there's a lot of tension, thanks to our friends at ESPN, um, around the marathon and the big events. So now we're moving the kids' events front and center. Our New York City half marathon, 40,000 people apply, we'll have 20,000 people run through Times Square in two weeks. And for the first time, we're doing a kids' 1,500 meter right in the middle of it. And the kids are gonna be running alongside the, the adults, while the adults are coming through Times Square in the middle of their half marathon. Marathon Sunday, we want to put the kids on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge to kick off the marathon. And what that will do is hopefully by bringing glory and attention to the kids' sport, like we have the adult sport, maybe parents will begin to see the benefits and, and be even more interested in seeing it in their school. And then they too can ultimately see that um, it's something the whole family can do. I have a question here. Yeah, uh, just a, a, a point here. I'm Jerry Joy. I'm here at Children's National Medical Center. I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist, and my big area is concussion, but really it's about kids and their development, ultimately. And I want to use an example of uh, my second daughter, who was introduced to uh, Maryland sport, which actually is horseback riding, but in fact, she played lacrosse. And um, one of the nicest things that a coach said to her at the end of her season was, play basketball. You need to go out and play basketball. And all I can say is my kids, the best sport they could ever play was the one they were in that season. It was not about, you know, I've got to do this, that, or the other. It was, it was what I was doing now with my friends. But the nice thing about that lacrosse coach is he was encouraging a different sport. Now, it was complimentary. And in fact, if you look at the history of lacrosse and you realize that, in fact, James Naismith was the lacrosse coach before he started basketball, um, is that I would like to make a challenge to our national governing bodies. I actually sit on the uh, medical advisory board for USA Football. And we've been talking about this whole issue of developmental skills and what are the key fundamentals you really need to build is that the national governing bodies, as they're looking at developmental skills in their sports, start to talk with each other about what are those complementary skill sets and important developmental factors that could hand off from one season to the next. We realize there's competition in these organizations at some level, 
but the bottom line is we're all about kids' development. So I'd like to put a challenge out to our national governing bodies to be talking with each other about how they can work together on development. Thank okay, you. So, so the big idea there was our national governing bodies need to embrace this and promote this. Uh, and I'm going to give a, a bit of um, uh, uh, support for US hockey, USA hockey. Um, or as we call it, ice hockey in Australia, um, they have actually changed their athlete development model and they, in their materials, they actually, and I'm sure other sports do this, um, I see Kirk there, mm -hmm. tennis perhaps does this as well, um, they encourage their coaches and their, and their players on their websites and their materials to go and play other sports. And they, as a big, they took a big chance doing that because you, you, know, you want to start telling your kids go and play something else because you want to keep them. And it's actually it, it's enhanced their membership, it's enhanced their, their skill levels, and, uh, and it's, it's paying off for hockey. And, uh, and I suspect it'll pay off for a lot of other sports as well. So we have one more question. So don't forget, we want some big ideas here. Well, the idea that I'd like to contribute, and it's playing off of what Dave and Mary said, and I've had some experience with, it'd be more difficult for some groups and less difficult for others, but I think we need to consider having parent support teams and the criteria for a parent to be a part of a support team would be their commitment in signing a contract to facilitate their kids learning rather than direct it and in developing such teams as that they then could lead the conversation and and the the challenge to expand the sports understanding of their kids i mean that's a long-term thing but i think it's well worth investing the time and energy in any, any comments on that one? We have, um, and, and that, that appears to be one of the problems that we've talked about uh, in Project Play, in some of the meetings we've had. Parents really don't understand the sports system, how it works. Okay, and they don't, what they hear, what they see is Tiger Woods playing golf at four and, and Andre Agassi playing tennis at four and, you know, and they think, oh man, you know, and they get told by their coach, you better play this sport, they won't get a scholarship if they don't, if they don't start now and just play this. And they don't know any different. So educating the parents, because and, and, they're one of the gatekeepers of, of, of the decision makers, they're only the one. There's another gatekeeper. Do we have any facility operators here, people who rent facilities or you know, city planners type people? I mean, every sport is played in a, on a field in, the, in a town or a gym or somewhere. And, and most sports, mo most national governing bodies don't own their own facilities across the country. None of them do. They have to rent facilities somewhere. What if communities or the, or the YMCA's or whatever encourage sports to say, yeah, come and rent our facilities, but you get a discount if your kids are playing multiple sports. If, if we see you playing multiple sports, you get a discount to, use our, uh, to rent our, our fields. Yeah, and I don't know if it, does anyone do that. Can you grab the microphone, please? Can you grab the microphone, ma'am? Can you grab the microphone? Sorry. There's a policy play there um, because states um, and school districts and things have a concern on liabilities and there's a policy play to open your facilities with shared use. I'm from the uh, Safe Routes to School National Partnership. We have a clearinghouse about that if you want to look into it. But I think if you as sports, and when we said come together with health, and bring, if you're bringing this policy play of getting those doors open, and if, you, if we can give you that toolkit and the way to carry that forward with us in all of your leagues, well, that would be awesome. Um, I just want to make a point a little bit in a different direction, but I'm a huge believer that we need to double down on physical education in our PE teachers. The majority of kids' first exposure to sports is in PE. And people talk about how the bridges and tunnels in our country are like falling apart. Well, our bridges and tunnels are our PE programs, and right now they're in huge decay. We have PE that's happening once a week or not at all. The PE teachers are getting almost no training. The sporting equipment that they have is almost non-existent in many of these schools. So I think if we really want to get sports sampling, I think it's these PE teachers. We have to be fighting to, to regrow PE programs and get kids back doing physical education. And I think they're, they're a huge army sitting out there that we can train and teach, not just to teach a lot of different sports, but the, the gentleman from ESPN, all the character development skills. Imagine our PE teachers providing this huge value to these schools by teaching character development through sports and really training them. And a lot of them would love to do this, but they're, they're not really getting, there's a, a huge disconnect. So we have all these leagues and teams outside the schools, but at the end of the day, 95% of our kids, I don't know what the exact statistic are, are their, their sport exposure is PE during the day. 
And we need to help them in a huge way because that's really where it starts. That's where kids, if they get bad exposure, they're only being exposed to a few sports, they don't have it at all. I think it's impacting everything that goes on up from there. I think we have time for one more question. <coughs> Maybe two or three. I'm looking at my timekeeper here because we need to go to the graphic and then we need to uh, bring these ideas together. So, sir, your question. Can you uh, make it's more of a, a comment and to address what, what Jerry had said. I'm uh, Brian Hainline, the chief medical officer for the NCAA, and I'll be talking about this more at one. But we, we just uh, finished uh, Monday and Tuesday a soccer summit. And it was with all of the stakeholders of soccer, so going from U Soccer, U.S. Soccer Federation, FIFA, and then we had coaches from all three divisions, uh, university presidents, commissioners, athletic directors, and sports scientists. And we're going to do this with every sport. And the idea is that what was really cool at the summit is to hear the coaches and, and the federation and scientist leaders saying, our kids that are playing soccer, that are playing multiple sports, their injury rates are actually much less because they know how to fall, they know how to land, they know how to kick, and they're not so over-specialized. And what's going to come out of this sport by sport is to link with the national governing bodies for all of them to say, at an early age, we really need sport sampling. This, this is what, how we're going to develop actually sport for life, but also the best kids that are, that are going to play in college. They really will be athletes. So, so we, are, we are trying to walk the walk, and, I, and it was actually a very, very cool two days. Very good. Any comments on that from that? I think just, just to add on to that, in all of our, especially we have a wide variety of um, people from all over the country, but in the cities and where there are NGBs and there's pro teams, the more each group just t offers a free program to, to a local school and to train the PE teachers, as Tim said, but the more we all go in with the mindset, what we've done is really shifted. From our early days, we had a really comprehensive program. Now we go in and say, you know what, two days of running, one day of running. It's great to do fencing, basketball, ping pong, whatever the other sports are. And the more we all have a, if everyone did their little bit of free programming offered to schools and with an open mind of, we want the kids doing other sports too. Yeah, and Brian, I would just say that it's huge when someone at your level is able to trickle that down to the parent community because I think it's one of people's biggest fears is, a, is around, um, you know, you, 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 you don't want to play the fear factor game with them, but everybody thinks they want their kid to be able to play at the next level, but no one, on the other hand, wants their kid to get hurt. And if you can prove that the best athletes where you are are actually the multi-sport athletes and they're less likely to get hurt, then everybody is going to benefit from that. Yeah. There was someone with the microphone already over here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Dom from Play Rugby USA in New York City, and my sort of comment and suggestion definitely builds off uh, the story Steve told and then what Tim's just been talking about as well is, um, I guess, around coach education and reform. How many of our coaches are modeling what they're asking the kids to do? So the, the example of the lacrosse uh, coach telling the kid to go off and play basketball. Uh, I'd be interested to see how many other sports maybe that coach actually works on as well? Are they coaching lacrosse and basketball and soccer and football? And sort of how do we talk about the, the benefits of it? Um, but I'm sort of a big advocate for, for modeling it and showing it to the kids as well that I'm involved in a bunch of different sports. I'm not just a basketball coach. and I'm not just a, uh, a football coach. So um, I think if we can get our coaches to model and lead the way and show that it's a good thing to be involved in lots of different sports, then hopefully the kids will sort of pick up on that and, and follow that lead. Okay, what we need to do, I'm sorry, I know there's a lot of comments and so forth. We might be able to grab some more at the end if we, if we can have a few minutes to spare. Uh, we need to go to the graphic, and Jim is going to put into words what he's been putting into words on the, on the white paper here. This is impressive, isn't it? Yes. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, this is just like the previous uh, session. This just flew by, and I know there's probably tons of more ideas out there. So uh, just to recap, um, specialization is sort of the... the the bad word here today, and, and I think everybody's in agreement about the, the need for um, giving, giving kids as broad exposure to sports as possible to a wide variety of sports. Um, it's the improving the school climate, 
So it's the, the, everything you look for in sports, building empathy and respect, sense of control, building trust, uh, you know, provide the opportunity, the, the crossover effect, that idea that um, actually specialization may be what's holding your, your student athlete back. It's the, uh, the more you sample, the more different sports you're involved with, the broader your exposure, you're going to reduce your injuries, and you're going to be a better athlete, more well-rounded athlete for a longer time. Uh, the, the part about the educating the parents, this came up with the previous session as well. Giving them a realistic picture of, of what the sports program is about, what they're trying to accomplish, and it's not just get them into college and get them a, a free ride. Uh, providing that, that uh, training and support to the coaches, uh, not just the, the individuals, but giving them the tools they need and the, and the resources to have an effective physical education program in the schools. The national governing bodies need they're starting, it sounds like they're starting to, but they need to continue that conversation of how they can complement each other and how this drive to specialize and to lock kids in. I love the story about the your daughter's our number one, number one prospect, and then, oh, well, we changed your mind. This, this idea that everybody benefits by that, by that uh, sampling. Um, yeah, and then just um, the, the, the thought about giving the student, the, the kids, the student, I, I shouldn't say student athletes, it sounds like the, you know, the scholarships. It's the, all of them, all of our kids who are, who are taking part in sports, give them visibility in the community so that they're out there, they're out there taking part in the big races, they're getting the coverage as, uh, just as well as the adults. Um, and the facility operators that, that addressing that issue of, uh, which also came up um, in the last session about making those, you know, those top-notch facilities available for a wider range of people to use, and not be concerned about well, we just that's just for the specialists. So, did I miss anything? I don't think so. We talked. Uh, well, phys ed teachers. You talked about that. Mm -hmm. Phys ed teachers. Phys ed teachers. Parents. Coaches. Uh, some of the big stakeholders in this thing, you know, obviously it's about kids, youth sport, but, but they're the ones that are <coughs> driving their kids to events and they're the ones that are, you know, registering them for programs, at, at not, not the free play, which was the last session, but when they're involved in organised systematic sport. You know, it's the parents, it's the coaches, it's the national governing bodies who have uh, the opportunity to spread the word, like, like US Hockey did. And so there's a lot of, a lot of different people here who can, who can pull this together. So I want to make sure we've got the big ideas because not that I'm competitive, but the other panels are coming up with ideas and our panel needs, needs to go. Okay, so uh, one more thing before I finish and I want to bring up Kim Cray. No, I'm not going to bring up Kim because Kim's not here. I'm going to bring up Risa and she's going to talk about one of the commitments that we have. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Um, I've, I've missed most of uh, the sport sampling panel, but it, from the recap uh, that I just heard, it sounds like this was a really, really important session um, and that there are a lot of great ideas and just a lot of fiery people who are in this room, and that's really important for doing what we're trying to do. Um, one of those groups uh, that's, that's doing what we're trying to do and that I would encourage all of you to reach out to, I think she'll be back later today. Um, I understand she had to run to a meeting at the White House, perhaps. Um, <laughs> I guess that's a, a casualty of being in D.C. But um, she, uh, Kimberly Clay from Play Like a Girl, it's a nonprofit organization that focuses um, specifically on girls and, and really with an outreach to African-American and Hispanic girls. And uh, they filled out our What's Your Play form, and they shared with us their play, which is a new uh, marketing campaign that they're running in May 2015, which is National Fitness, uh, Physical Fitness and Sports Month. And uh, the first phase of that campaign specifically will focus on sport sampling by bringing back play and just really being active in a variety of ways. The second phase of which it sounds like really reaches out to mothers and, and asks them to help be uh, part of the solution for their kids, understanding the powers that moms have in this space and to encourage them to remember what it was like to have free play and to, to incur um, all the sport sampling that maybe they had just casually playing uh, growing up. And then extend, so that's in May 2015, and then extending into spring 2016, they're going to be launching a spring break camp for girls, and that camp is going to all be focused on sampling and providing a variety of experiences to help girls find sports that they love and help them find the, uh, you know, their power through sports. So we're grateful to uh, Play Like a Girl for this commitment that has 
a few different stages to it. Encourage all of you as you sit here today to think about what your play is. And please let us know online, bit.ly.com slash our play. It's in your program. It's, you'll see it around the, the summit um, for the next few hours as well. So just think about that. But that's one great thing. And, and you know, the point of all this really is so that you all know that when you make your play, you're doing so with other people because no one organization can be the solution to all of this. It really takes that collective impact model. And knowing what everyone else is doing uh, hopefully helps you focus on what it is that you're doing, knowing that all these other pieces are coming into play around you. So this is one piece. We're really looking forward to hearing what your pieces and your plays are as well. And that's great. So up next is lunch. Um, we're going to head down to the seventh floor for that. Um, we would encourage you two things. One is during lunch, Indy Cowie, you all saw her demoing her soccer skills on stage, is going to be in room 704, where the parkour uh, kids were earlier today. And she'll be teaching. She has some soccer balls out there. She's ready to play with you, uh, teaching some tricks. So please stop by before lunch, during lunch, at the end of lunch, to have some fun with her and really try your hand at this free play creativity. Also, please stop by and sign our... Uh, poster board with our We Envision statement. If you believe in an America in which all kids have the opportunity to be active through sports, please sign that and let us know so that we can share with everyone, everyone who's on board with that. Uh, so thanks so much. I'm turning it over to Peter again, and we look forward to seeing you back here uh, or on the seventh floor after lunch for some more great sessions. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that we, uh, we thank the panelists for, for being here and telling us their stories. <laughs>